They looked down on me, certain that the color of my skin mattered more than the wealth and ideas I brought. They denied me the loan without giving me a chance. But how shocked they will be when they find out that I'm now the new owner of their bank. I have always believed in the power of action. Money, resources, connections, all of these are tools that in my hands become a powerful force. But what do you do when these tools become useless? What do you do when the system you rely on turns against you, ignoring everything you stand for? This morning, I felt on top of the world. The project I'd been working on for the past few years was closer to being realized than ever before. It was supposed to change lives. We're talking about hundreds, thousands of sick children who could gain access to the latest technologies and treatments. I knew that this project was not only important, but also capable of making a real contribution to society. All the calculations, all the plans were in place. The only thing left was to secure the funding. What could possibly go wrong? I'm a billionaire, a name known in the financial world, and my project is flawless from a business perspective. Money always means power, and I thought I had everything under control. But, as is often the case with illusions, they dissolve at the moment you least expect. As I was driving to the bank for a meeting with their representatives, I felt confident. This visit was nothing out of the ordinary. I had met with banks countless times, discussing major deals, financing, investments. Everything was going according to the usual script, and I hadn't even considered the possibility of obstacles. Yet deep down, perhaps in the furthest recesses of my mind, where past pains are stored, something unsettling was beginning to stir. In this world, too often, the color of your skin matters more than who you are. But I brushed those thoughts aside. Who could have imagined that in the 21st century, with me standing at the pinnacle of success, someone would dare to judge me not by my achievements, but by stereotypes? I was sure that numbers and facts spoke for themselves. But at that time, I had no idea that an encounter with bias could topple all my plans like a house of cards. I walked into the bank's office the same way I always did, with confidence. My steps were measured, my suit impeccably tailored, and the documents, prepared by the best lawyers and economists, were in perfect order. The secretary led me into the conference room, and through the glass partition, I saw the senior manager, George Harrison. His face was familiar to me. This man was known for his tough yet professional approach to deals. We exchanged formal greetings, and I laid the documents out in front of him. His face gave nothing away. As I began explaining the project, he nodded, but there was none of the interest I was used to seeing. On the contrary, there was something in his gaze that unsettled me. It was barely noticeable, like a shadow passing across someone's face just before you turn off the light. I explained the project, the technologies, the forecasts, the research, everything in those documents spoke for itself. For me, this was a formality. The deal, as I thought, was nearly closed. But just when I expected the usual discussion of terms, Harrison suddenly closed the folder, placed it on the table, and crossed his arms. A cold smile appeared on his face, and I felt a tension rise inside me. Apologies, he said without lifting his eyes, but we cannot approve your request. I looked at him, trying to understand what was wrong. The financial side of the project was flawless. I had checked everything down to the last digit. I asked, what exactly is causing concern? We're talking about a project that will save countless lives. The financial guarantees and growth projections are top notch. I don't understand what the problem is. Harrison finally looked me in the eye, but there was nothing in his gaze except icy detachment. We've decided not to support this project, he repeated, his tone pointedly polite but with not even a hint of room for discussion. My heart sank. I could feel my muscles tense. But what shocked me most was his absolute certainty that he could speak to me this way, as if I didn't matter. I felt something like a strange premonition, vague yet alarming. This wasn't a typical rejection. I don't understand, I began again, but he interrupted me. You don't need to understand, mister. He paused as if choosing his words. It's simply not in the bank's interest. His tone was so sharp that I fell silent for a moment. And then, 
as if a lightning bolt struck me, it hit me. This wasn't about my project, the numbers, or the money. This was about me, about the color of my skin. This rejection had nothing to do with financial logic. It was a biased decision made for one reason and one reason alone. I walked out of the bank with a heavy heart. To the average passerby, there would have been nothing unusual about me. A confident man in an expensive suit, seemingly in control of everything. But inside, I was boiling. At first, it felt like a quiet flame, slowly igniting, making my skin tingle. Then it grew into a raging fire. I couldn't believe that in this day and age, at my level of success, I was still facing such treatment. My head was throbbing with thoughts. I replayed Harrison's words, the icy look he gave me. This wasn't just rudeness or a misunderstanding. It was a deliberate choice to reject me. Me, someone who had achieved enough success that my name should have long erased any barriers. Yet to them, I was still someone they looked down upon. Anger churned inside me. But more importantly, it transformed into something else. Resolve. I could have gone to another bank where I would be treated the way I deserved. I could have walked away from this and signed a deal with someone less biased. But that path no longer satisfied me. I could no longer walk away from these situations in silence. I stopped in the middle of the street and looked back at the bank I had just left. In that moment, I made a decision. This wouldn't just be about revenge. I would do something bigger. I would come back. I would change their system from within, force them to confront their own injustice. This time, they wouldn't be able to look away. I knew the road ahead would be long, but I was ready for it, ready to put everything on the line, to prove, not just to them, but to myself, that this system could and must be changed. This was no longer just a personal struggle. It was a symbol of what millions face. I vowed that this bank would never again reject anyone because of the color of their skin. But for that, I needed to seize power. I knew this was only the beginning dot. After that meeting at the bank, something inside me changed forever. I had always believed that money was a tool capable of opening every door and breaking down any barrier. But the cold smirk on Harrison's face, his undisguised disdain, that was a lesson I couldn't forget. In a society I thought to be modern and progressive, there were still walls that couldn't be torn down by capital alone. Walls built on prejudice, hatred, and fear of the unfamiliar. Sitting at the large desk in my home office, I reflected on how far things had gone. The bank that denied me a loan, not because of financial risks, but because of the color of my skin, wasn't just one of those old institutions clinging to outdated values. It had become, to me, a symbol of the entire system that had kept people like me at arm's length for years. I could have just let it go, found another bank, struck a profitable deal. But that was no longer enough. Now it had become personal. It was a challenge I couldn't ignore. Revenge? Perhaps one might call my desire to change them from the inside that. But it was more than just revenge. I saw not only my own humiliation, but also the hundreds of other people who had faced the same barrier as I had. This bank, this system, had to change. And I decided to play by their rules, though in the end, it would be me who would rewrite those rules. That evening, I resolved to approach this differently. I wouldn't just seek surface-level justice. No, I would go deeper. I would find out who really ran that bank, who made the decisions, who owned the shares, and how could I undermine their power using my own resources? The strategy was simple. If they couldn't see me as a person, I would make them see me as an owner. I began with an analysis. The bank that rejected me was one of the oldest and most conservative financial institutions in the country. Its shares were traded on the stock exchange, and the management always prided itself on the fact that the majority of its shareholders were families who had owned the bank for generations. Such organizations rarely embrace change, and even more rarely allow outside players to interfere in their affairs. But I knew that in this world, nothing is impossible, especially when you have the resources and the patience. 
I could have bought shares directly, but that would have immediately drawn attention. No, my strategy required discretion, so as not to raise any suspicions. I hired several intermediary companies, each tasked with purchasing small shares, quietly distributing them among themselves. It was a slow process, and each day my lawyers and financial analysts reported on the progress. Meetings with my advisors were held in strict confidence. No one could know that these acquisitions were connected to me. I watched the numbers, the charts, and with each passing day, I felt myself getting closer to my goal. It was a chess match, and I was moving my pieces so that no one would notice the game had even begun. One of my advisors, Thomas, sitting across from me, noted that the bank was still firmly under the control of the founding family. He looked at me and said, They won't give up control without a fight. They have too much influence, too many connections. I stared thoughtfully at the stock charts in front of me. Won't give it up, I said quietly, feeling my resolve harden. We're not going to ask them, we'll just take it. I understood that this process would take time, weeks, perhaps months. But I was determined. I could afford to wait. Each fraction, each share brought me closer to the moment when I could change the game forever. A few weeks had passed since I began quietly acquiring shares. The work was slow, but steady. I took care not to attract unnecessary attention, and my intermediaries executed their tasks flawlessly. During this time, I had revisited my plan and refined it down to the smallest details. Everything had to be perfect. Any mistake could cost me too much. One morning, I was sitting in my office when my phone rang. It was Thomas. We have good news, his voice was measured, but I could sense the hidden excitement. We've reached the threshold you specified. You now own a significant share of the bank. I picked up my cup of coffee, feeling a mix of satisfaction and impatience building within me. Excellent, I said calmly. This is just the beginning. Thomas continued, In a couple more weeks, we'll have enough leverage to enter the board of directors. No one will expect you, through these companies, to become a major shareholder. I smiled. No one was supposed to expect it. My plan relied on their overconfidence, on their belief in the stability of their world. They had no idea that the ground beneath them had already begun to shift. The turning point came a few days later, when I received official notification that my stake in the bank was now large enough to claim a seat on the board. This was the first real victory. They had no idea that behind all these companies stood me, and they had no inkling of the changes I was about to bring. In that moment, as I held the notification in my hands, I knew that my place in the bank was nearly secured. I was determined to see it through to the end. No one knew it yet but soon they would realize I wasn't just claiming a stake in their world. I was going to change it. And this was only the beginning dot. No one suspected that a stranger had already been sitting at their table for some time. I looked at the market data screens displaying the bank's stock charts and couldn't help but feel a strange sense of satisfaction. It was like a complex chess game. Every move had to be calculated several steps ahead. I made my moves cautiously, without attracting attention, and as it turned out, even the most experienced players hadn't noticed my presence. The process of acquiring shares had gone more smoothly than I had anticipated. Throughout it all, I remained in the shadows, using several independent intermediaries so that no one could trace it back to me. It was almost laughable to think that these seasoned bankers, accustomed to total transparency and control, had no idea that one of their largest shareholders was me. They saw only charts and numbers, while the real game was unfolding right under their noses. When I first embarked on this plan, I wasn't sure I could pull it off. I had to move with extreme caution, knowing that one wrong step could reveal that someone was systematically buying up shares with the intent to gain control. But now, months later, I was closer to my goal than ever. My plan was working flawlessly, and no one suspected a thing. My emotional state was strange. On one hand, I felt satisfaction from infiltrating a system that had once seemed impenetrable. On the other hand, I was still filled with the same burning anger from that first day, when they rejected me simply because I didn't fit their norms. This was revenge, yes, but it wasn't revenge for revenge's sake. 
I wanted to show these people that their game no longer belonged to them. This morning, I once again reviewed my stock portfolio. I already had enough to wield significant influence, but it wasn't enough. I was waiting for the moment when I could secure the controlling stake. And when that moment came, they would realize that the game had long since begun, and the rules had been changing with every passing second dot. Waiting had always been the hardest part for me. I was used to taking action, to being in control, but this time, everything didn't depend solely on my decisions. My plan was designed so that pressure would start building inside the bank from the new shareholders I had strategically brought in. Various groups of investors, unknowingly acting in alignment with my intentions, began voicing their demands, forcefully pushing their agendas within the bank's policies. Little did they know, they were following my script. Every day, I received reports on the bank's internal affairs. Everything was unfolding predictably. Conflicts between different factions in the board, attempts by some executives to maintain control, rumors of instability. My phone was buzzing constantly with calls from people I had hired to orchestrate this small revolution. The bank was slowly descending into chaos. We've got a problem, one of my advisors said during a video call. The board is split into two camps. Some are pushing for radical reorganization, while others want to keep the old ways intact. Everyone's waiting for your move. I looked at his worried face on the screen, his concerned eyes. Like many others, he didn't know that I had anticipated all of this. Let them argue, I said calmly. Give them time. But the longer this goes on, the worse it will be for the bank. You risk losing support from some shareholders. I smiled, leaning back in my chair, exhaling deeply. We're not losing anything. They're getting more entangled while I'm getting closer. And just when they think they've lost everything, I'll take control. All it takes is patience. My plan wasn't just to become part of the bank. I wanted to watch as they destroyed their own old foundations, clinging to their privileges. This chaos was my tool. The deeper they sank into conflict, the closer I moved toward my goal. Dot. The day finally came when I could claim my seat on the board of directors. Everything was unfolding exactly as I had planned. The board had been weakened by internal conflicts, and no one could figure out where the pressure was coming from. They were all waiting for someone to take control, but none of them suspected that person would be me. The meeting was scheduled for the following week. I sat in my office, replaying the upcoming events in my mind. No one knew that when I entered that room, everything would change forever. This time, I wouldn't be asking or persuading. I would walk in as an owner, someone who already controlled a large portion of the bank, and they would have no choice but to accept me on my terms. I gathered all the necessary documents. This was the final piece of my plan, ensuring that everything was legally sound and ready for presentation. When I showed my stock rights to one of my lawyers, he simply nodded. Are you ready? He asked, raising an eyebrow slightly. I set the papers down on the table and nodded, suppressing the satisfaction welling up inside. More than ready. Tomorrow, they'll see who really controls their world. And so, I walked into the bank, the same bank I once approached seeking a loan. But this time, everything was different. I wasn't the person asking for approval anymore. Now I was the one making decisions. The board had already gathered, but they didn't realize that the main player was already among them. In that moment, I felt a strange mix of emotions, satisfaction, anger, and resolve. When I was invited into the boardroom, all eyes turned to me. The faces of the old executives twisted in shock. I had no intention of making dramatic statements. I simply took my seat and laid the documents in front of me. Mr. Harrison, I addressed the very manager who had once denied me. I believe our relationship is going to be quite different now. He turned pale. The pause lasted only a few seconds, but in those moments I felt the world shift. The system that had once rejected me was no more. Now it belonged to me, and this was only the beginning. Dot. The bank's boardroom I stepped into that day was no longer just a place for business meetings. It had become a battlefield, invisible to the eye, but filled with clashes of interests, ambitions, and fear. For the first time in months, 
I entered the bank not as a client, not as an investor with intentions, but as the one who held the keys to its future. Knowing that none of them had any idea I had been orchestrating things from behind the scenes all this time filled me with a quiet sense of triumph. My heart beat steadily, calmly. There was no nervousness inside me, only pure confidence. I walked down the corridors built for those accustomed to ruling, fully aware that today these walls would witness something far greater than an ordinary business meeting. This wasn't just another shareholder gathering. It was the culmination of a game I had set in motion months ago. Before entering the room where the board of directors had assembled, I paused for a moment to collect my thoughts. In that instant, all my reflections condensed into one memory of the very rejection I had received here, back when I was merely a client, a man with big ideas but no backing. The irony of the situation wasn't lost on me. I was returning to the same place where I had once left humiliated, but now I was a completely different person. Today, I intended to show them that sometimes weakness turns into strength, if you know how to play the game dot. When I walked into the room, the conversations immediately fell silent. The board of directors was already seated around the long table, documents spread before them. The faces of senior shareholders and executives reflected a mix of boredom and mild wariness. They likely expected nothing out of the ordinary from today's meeting. Routine corporate procedures, the usual business discussions. What they didn't know was that the real event was just about to begin. I took a seat directly across from George Harrison, the very manager who had once dismissed me so casually and indifferently. He seemed surprised by my presence but his face remained calm, as if it didn't matter. His confidence suddenly struck me as almost comical. Mr. Harrison, I began, crossing my arms and locking eyes with him. How nice it is to see you again. It appears I've finally found a way to get what I need from your bank. He glanced at me with a faint smirk, but it was clear he hadn't fully grasped what I was implying. Forgive me, but I don't believe we've been properly introduced, he responded, feigning innocence. Oh yes, quite well, I replied, my voice steady. I'm the man you rejected for financing during my last visit. You were so confident back then, claiming that my project wasn't of interest to the bank, though you gave no real explanation for it. At that moment, I noticed some of the faces around the table beginning to change. Confusion and a hint of unease crept into their expressions. They didn't fully understand what was happening, but they could sense that this was no ordinary meeting. I'm not entirely sure where you're going with this, Harrison said cautiously, his gaze dropping to his papers as if hoping to deflect the conversation. It's simple, I continued, not allowing him to evade the discussion. Today, I sit at this table not as a guest, not as a client. I sit here as the new majority shareholder. I now have more power in this bank than you do. And I think it's time we had a serious conversation about the future of this institution. A sudden silence filled the room. Harrison looked at me, then at the other board members, trying to process what I had just said. The realization began to settle in. I could see the tension spreading across their faces as the atmosphere shifted. The bank they had considered their stronghold was now in my hands. They hadn't just lost control, They'd lost it to the very person they had once dismissed without a second thought dot. The other board members looked as if they had suddenly realized their familiar world was collapsing around them. The rustling of papers, hushed whispers, and quiet conversations filled the room. My lawyer, who was seated nearby, handed me a folder containing the final documents, confirmation that I now held enough shares to have full influence over the bank's policy. This was the final stroke in my carefully crafted plan. Harrison, who had maintained a veneer of confidence until now, could no longer hide his shock. He stared at the documents in front of him, scrutinizing the numbers that could no longer be disputed. This, this is impossible, his voice wavered. How did you, how, I said, feeling the thrill of triumph grow with every second. While you were busy clinging to your outdated ways, the world around you changed, and now, this bank belongs to me. All you can do now is accept it. Several of the board members began whispering to one another, struggling to process the situation. 
but it was too late. I now held their future in my hands. In the coming weeks, I continued, rising from my seat, significant changes will be made to the management of this bank. We will undergo a thorough reorganization. We will eliminate outdated and discriminatory practices, and this institution will finally reflect the new era. Those unwilling to adapt may leave. Those who stay will be part of a new future. Harrison couldn't suppress his anger any longer. His face twisted as he fought to maintain his composure. This isn't over, he hissed, leaning forward. We'll find a way to take it back. I smiled, looking at him with mild contempt. No, Harrison, this is the end. You're no longer playing this game. As I walked out of the boardroom, I felt a deep sense of resolution settle within me. I hadn't just won this battle. I had rewritten the rules. The bank now belonged to me, and with it, the control over an institution that had once rejected me. Revenge? Perhaps. But this was more than that. It was justice. On my terms, Dot. Becoming a member of the board of directors, I felt for the first time in a long while the true weight of control and the power to change something far greater than my own life. But with that came the burden of responsibility. The influence I had gained now depended not only on my decisions, but on how effectively I could seize this second chance. A chance not just to reclaim a sense of justice, but to transform the entire system. I often thought about the day I was first denied the loan. Back then, the sting of injustice burned deep. But now I realized that every rejection, every humiliation had tempered me. It wasn't just a personal incident. It was a symptom of a system that, for years, had excluded people, basing its decisions on bias and discrimination. Today was the day I could correct the mistake the bank had made when it rejected my project to help sick children. A mistake rooted in racial prejudice which now had to be set right. I knew my next step would be the foundation for future changes, not just in this bank, but perhaps in the banking system as a whole. I couldn't afford to make another mistake. At stake were not just my pride or sense of justice. At stake were the lives of those who genuinely needed help. And that knowledge made me stronger, Dot. When I began the bank's reorganization, I knew there would be resistance. People are reluctant to embrace change, especially those who have long benefited from the status quo. The old leadership, with the exception of a few reform-minded members who supported my vision, was openly hostile. Their views were as rigid as ice, and any move toward fairness seemed to them like a threat. At the first board meeting, I laid out my strategy clearly. My first proposal was to establish a new committee focused on equitable loan distribution. The primary goal of this committee would be to eliminate any signs of discrimination based on race, age, social status, or other factors irrelevant to a client's financial capability. The system we are using is outdated, I said, making eye contact with each board member. We cannot afford to make decisions based on personal biases or outdated stereotypes. We must create a fair and transparent lending system. I was met with the expected resistance. One of the oldest board members, Mr. Dalton, raised an eyebrow and gave me a cold stare. You really think you can just walk in here and change everything we've built over the years? People get loans based on their ability to repay, and that's how it's always been. What's changed? What's changed, I replied, calmly but firmly is that we can no longer afford to ignore reality. The bank has lost the opportunity to help those who truly need it because we've been turning a blind eye to people we could be supporting. Can't you see how that damages the bank's reputation? My voice didn't waver, but the tension in the room was palpable. A few board members shifted in their seats, hesitant to openly support me, but also not voicing outright opposition. I knew these people were accustomed to a different reality one where change was a distant concept. They wouldn't shift overnight. But if I could prove the strength of my decisions, they would come to understand that change was not only inevitable, but also beneficial. This was just the beginning. They would resist, but soon they would realize that the future I was building wasn't a threat. It was an opportunity. A few days after the committee was officially established, the first meeting took place. I felt as if I were standing at the threshold of another pivotal moment in my life. 
It wasn't that I had doubts, but the memory of the past, of that day when I was denied, when I was rejected, still lingered in my mind. But now, everything was different. I wasn't a guest. I was the one making the decisions. And the first decision I brought to the table was the very project for which I had once been denied funding, the project to treat sick children. Now there were no barriers, no limits, except those in my own mind. The meeting began calmly. The project documents were laid out on the table, and I studied them carefully, feeling a familiar fire of justice ignite within me. I looked up and began, this project was rejected for reasons that had nothing to do with its financial viability. Today, we reconsider it. We have a responsibility to support it, and I propose that we approve full funding. Some committee members, those with more conservative views, started raising questions about profitability and risks. But this time, I was ready. I had all the answers, and I wouldn't let them use the same tired arguments to stop what needed to be done. I don't doubt the risks, said one of the members, Mr. Houston, but honestly, we have other projects that could yield higher returns. Why should we take this risk? I looked at him steadily and replied, because we're talking about the lives of children. If we have the means to help, we have an obligation to do so. The question isn't how much profit we can make. It's about whether our bank can become a force for good and change. The words hung in the air and silence filled the room. I could see that this was an argument they couldn't easily counter. The bank couldn't afford to appear indifferent to human lives. In the end, the vote was held and the project was approved. I felt the weight that had been pressing on me for months begin to lift. This wasn't just about winning a battle in the boardroom. It was the knowledge that I had finally corrected the wrong they had once made. Now, the lives of those children were saved because of my efforts. And this was only the first step. There was still much work to be done, but I knew that by starting with this, I could change not only the bank, but the future for many who had been previously rejected. Now, I was no longer someone who could be stopped dot ever since I gained control of the majority shares. Each day brought its own challenges. I knew people don't like change, especially those who have grown comfortable with stability and power but the depth of resistance from the bank's old guard turned out to be even stronger and more entrenched than I had anticipated. The longtime members of the board seemed to unite against me, as if sensing that their world was collapsing. Every proposal I made, every initiative I introduced, was met with passive resistance, hidden discontent, and empty promises to address the issues. I watched as, slowly but surely, the bank began slipping back into the same bureaucratic quagmire from which I was trying to pull it out. What they saw as stability, I saw as stagnation. I often asked myself, why is this so difficult? Can't they see that change is inevitable? Or are they so blinded by their fear of losing control that they're willing to sacrifice everything to maintain their grip on power? I wasn't new to the business world, but this situation tested my patience like nothing before. It felt like every step I took created even more obstacles, as if I were swimming against the tide. But one thing was clear, giving up was not an option. It became evident that the resistance from the old guard wasn't just a temporary wave I could wait out. It was a serious threat to my plans and the future of the bank. It was time to respond to this challenge with more decisive action. And I knew that to break this cycle, radical measures would be necessary. The bank needed a complete overhaul, and the days of subtle diplomacy were over dot. At the latest board meeting, I could feel the tension rising. My proposal to reform the bank's lending policy, a crucial step in creating fairer financial resource distribution, was once again met with near silence. Every time I raised the issue, the senior members found ways to delay citing the need for further research or time for adaptation. Mr. Dalton, one of the most influential and long-standing members of the board, began his familiar speech. We need to be cautious with such radical changes, he said, with the same condescending confidence he always had. This bank has operated for decades on established principles. We can't just turn everything upside down. Our clients trust our approach. 
I couldn't contain the anger that had been simmering inside me for months. Clients trust us because they have no other choice, I replied firmly. We can't keep operating under old rules if we want to remain competitive and fair. Our principles are outdated. We either move forward or we'll face the consequences. I could see fear in the eyes of some board members, but it wasn't fear for the bank. It was fear of losing control. They weren't afraid of change itself. They were afraid that these changes would leave them behind. I pressed on. This bank cannot stay stuck in the past. The reforms I'm proposing will help us adapt to the future. If we continue to ignore this, we'll find ourselves left behind while the world moves on without us. Despite my words, the resistance was palpable. I knew that without radical action, this deadlock could drag on for months, maybe even years. If I wanted to see my vision realized, I had to act decisively and quickly. The time for subtlety had passed. It was clear that the old guard would never willingly give up their hold on the bank's future unless I forced the issue. I needed to take more aggressive steps to secure the change I believed in, or risk watching the institution sink further into irrelevance. Dot the following week, I called for an emergency shareholders meeting. My decision was driven by one simple fact. Without the shareholders backing, the old leadership would continue to sabotage my reforms. I could no longer afford to wait. The time for action had come. I decided to use every resource at my disposal to completely reshape the board of directors. The future of the bank would be decided at this meeting. The agenda I laid out focused on a leadership overhaul and the implementation of a new strategy aimed at modernization and eliminating discriminatory practices in lending. The meeting hall was packed to capacity. Shareholders had gathered in anticipation of discussing monumental changes. I knew that many of them feared radical reforms, but I also knew they had seen the bank's slow decline in the market. My task was clear, to convince them that I was the one who could lead the bank into a new future. As I stood before the audience, I felt a sense of excitement, not nervousness, but the thrill of entering a critical battle, one I was prepared to win. Ladies and gentlemen, I began, making eye contact with as many as I could. This bank is at a crossroads. We can either cling to outdated principles that no longer serve us, or we can move forward. I offer a future where this bank becomes a symbol of fairness, growth, and progress. The room grew still. My voice was steady, and I could see the expressions of the shareholders shift as I continued. Today, we decide which path to take. We can continue as we have been, watching the bank slowly fade, or we can embrace the risk and become a leader in the industry. Those unwilling to accept these changes will need to step aside. I propose a reorganization of the board of directors, and I am prepared to take full responsibility for leading this charge. The silence that followed was deafening. This was the moment of truth. The old leadership held their breath, realizing that their time might be coming to an end. Finally, one of the shareholders stood up and spoke. I believe it's time we move forward. The time for change has come. Those words were the signal everyone had been waiting for. The resistance from the old guard crumbled. I knew, in that moment, I had the support I needed, and that the outdated principles holding us back would no longer be a barrier to progress. The future of the bank was now in my hands. Dot when I called the emergency shareholders meeting, the air was already thick with tension. In recent weeks, everything in the bank had been moving too fast. The changes I had initiated were gaining momentum, and resistance was intensifying. I could feel that my opponents had been waiting for this exact moment, gathering what strength they had left to make their move. Time was running out, and I knew not everyone was ready for the changes I had proposed. They were accustomed to the old ways, to a culture that had grown outdated. But that culture was built on prejudice and privileges that could no longer stand. I understood that change always scares people, especially those who have spent decades enjoying the status quo. But change was inevitable. This was their reality, whether they wanted to accept it or not. I stood by the window in my office, looking down at the streets filled with people who had no idea about the invisible war unfolding inside the bank. 
They didn't know that the decisions made at this meeting could shape the future of the financial system, and perhaps even their own lives. In that moment, I realized the full weight of the upcoming gathering. This wasn't just a corporate meeting, it was a moment of truth where the future of the bank, and perhaps my own, would be decided. My opponents were powerful. They had influence, experience, and they knew how to manipulate public opinion and rally support from those afraid of losing their privileges. But I also knew I was ready. I had built my strategy in such a way that their resistance would ultimately prove futile. I was one step ahead, but the victory was not yet secured. The question was, who would crack under the pressure first? As the clock ticked closer to the meeting, the anticipation grew. My adversaries had their allies, but so did I. I knew the next few hours would be critical, where every word, every decision, could tip the balance. It wasn't just about winning this battle. It was about defining the future of an institution, and in turn, making sure it aligned with the vision I had fought so hard to bring to life. Dot. The meeting began with the usual atmosphere of formality, but the tension was palpable beneath the surface. Shareholders filled the spacious room, their faces betraying a range of emotions, from anxious uncertainty to the haughty confidence of those certain the old ways would prevail. I kept my own tension tightly controlled, outwardly calm as I observed them. Across from me stood Mr. Dalton, the primary champion of preserving the bank's outdated practices. His presence reminded me that every word I spoke today would be met with intense scrutiny. I didn't waste time with pleasantries. As I began my speech, I went straight to the point. We are here today because our bank stands at a crossroads. We can remain captives of old methods and watch our reputation continue to decline, or we can take a risk and move forward. This meeting is not just about reorganization, it's about the future of our bank. I outlined my plan. Removing those who resisted change, implementing a new corporate ethics code that would reshape the entire culture of the institution. I knew this would trigger a strong reaction, and I wasn't wrong. You are destroying everything we've built over the years, Dalton interrupted sharply, his anger barely concealed. You want to turn this bank into something unrecognizable. Your so-called changes will undermine the stability and trust of our clients. I held his gaze, aware that the room was watching our verbal duel. My response at this moment was crucial, not just to counter Dalton, but to speak to every shareholder in the room, especially those on the fence. It is not I who have undermined trust, Mr. Dalton, I replied calmly. Our outdated methods have done that long ago. We are losing our position in the market. We are losing clients. Discriminatory practices and archaic policies have brought us to this point. You speak of protecting stability, but what stability? The one that is already crumbling? This bank cannot operate under the laws of the past if it wants to survive in the future. The room fell silent. I could see my words were hitting their mark. Some shareholders exchanged glances, and I knew I had a chance. Your resistance, I continued, locking eyes with Dalton, will not only halt progress, it will destroy this bank. We can either move forward or lose everything we've worked for. I saw uncertainty flash in the eyes of many shareholders. They were beginning to realize that the era of the old guard was over, that clinging to power would be meaningless if it led to the bank's downfall. Dalton wanted to respond, but I knew he had nothing left to say. His position looked increasingly weak in the face of the arguments I had laid out. In that moment, the momentum shifted. The shareholders weren't just hearing a call for reform, they were seeing the crumbling foundations of the old ways. The realization was setting in. They could either stand by Dalton and watch the bank collapse, or embrace the future I was offering Dot. As the voting began, the tension in the room was palpable. It felt as if time had slowed down, with every shareholder fully aware that the outcome of this vote would change the bank forever. Each second dragged on, stretching into what felt like eternity. I watched as one by one shareholders stood to cast their votes. Some looked me in the eye, while others avoided my gaze. With each raised hand, I could feel the scales tipping back and forth, unsure of where they would finally settle. Deep down, though, I knew it was those who resisted change who feared this moment the most. 
When the final votes were tallied, a tense silence filled the room. I gripped the back of my chair, though my fingers were calm and steady. This was it, the moment I had been building toward. My eyes were fixed on the chairperson, waiting for the result. The votes are in, the chairperson's voice sliced through the quiet like a bolt of lightning. The reorganization plan and changes to the board of directors have been approved by a narrow margin. The room fell into an almost tangible silence. I exhaled slowly, taking in the weight of what had just happened. By the slimmest of margins, my plan had been accepted. The opposition had been defeated. I glanced at Dalton. His face had gone pale, his expression a mix of exhaustion and defeat. But I felt no pity. This had been a battle for the future, and there was no room for compromise in such a fight. The room remained quiet as the shareholders digested the results. I knew that I had won this battle, but the war was far from over. Now lay ahead the long road of changing the bank's culture, implementing new rules, and rooting out those who might still seek to undermine my efforts. But today had been pivotal. Inside, my emotions swirled, relief, triumph, but also the sobering realization that the fight was far from finished. The battle for the bank was won, but the real war for change was only just beginning. Dot. After that tense vote, won by the slimmest of margins, I realized that my work was only just beginning. The victory at the shareholders meeting had given me the authority for bold action, but with that power came a tremendous responsibility. Power isn't something you can simply hold without feeling its weight. It's fragile, and it can slip away with a single misstep. I stood at the window of my office, staring out at the world, though my thoughts were elsewhere. The bank I now led felt like a ship sailing through a storm. To steer it out of the chaos, I needed to shed the ballast. The people clinging to the old ways of doing business, those who had sabotaged my reforms and stood in the way of progress. Their time had passed, but I understood that this cleansing wasn't just a matter of firing a few people. It required surgical precision. I needed to remove those dragging the bank down without creating chaos in the process. Acting too hastily or too aggressively could incite even more resistance, and losing the fragile support I had gained could unravel everything I had worked for. I sat at my desk and looked at the list of names before me. I had a clear plan, meet with each of them personally. This wasn't just a matter of business etiquette, it was a matter of principle. I wanted to give them a chance to explain their actions, but I was resolute, their time was up, I'm. I held his gaze, aware that the room was watching our verbal duel. My response at this moment was crucial, not just to counter Dalton, but to speak to every shareholder in the room, especially those on the fence. It is not I who have undermined trust, Mr. Dalton, I replied calmly. Our outdated methods have done that long ago. We are losing our position in the market. We are losing clients. Discriminatory practices and archaic policies have brought us to this point. You speak of protecting stability, but what stability? The one that is already crumbling? This bank cannot operate under the laws of the past if it wants to survive in the future. The room fell silent. I could see my words were hitting their mark. Some shareholders exchanged glances, and I knew I had a chance. Your resistance, I continued, locking eyes with Dalton, will not only halt progress, it will destroy this bank. We can either move forward or lose everything we've worked for. I saw uncertainty flash in the eyes of many shareholders. They were beginning to realize that the era of the old guard was over, that clinging to power would be meaningless if it led to the bank's downfall. Dalton wanted to respond, but I knew he had nothing left to say. His position looked increasingly weak in the face of the arguments I had laid out. In that moment, the momentum shifted. The shareholders weren't just hearing a call for reform. They were seeing the crumbling foundations of the old ways. The realization was setting in. They could either stand by Dalton and watch the bank collapse or embrace the future I was offering Dot. As the voting began, the tension in the room was palpable. It felt as if time had slowed down, with every shareholder fully aware that the outcome of this vote would change the bank forever. 
Each second dragged on, stretching into what felt like eternity. I watched as one by one, shareholders stood to cast their votes. Some looked me in the eye, while others avoided my gaze. With each raised hand, I could feel the scales tipping back and forth, unsure of where they would finally settle. Deep down, though, I knew it was those who resisted change who feared this moment the most. When the final votes were tallied, a tense silence filled the room. I gripped the back of my chair, though my fingers were calm and steady. This was it, the moment I had been building toward. My eyes were fixed on the chairperson, waiting for the result. The votes are in, the chairperson's voice sliced through the quiet like a bolt of lightning. The reorganization plan and changes to the board of directors have been approved, by a narrow margin. The room fell into an almost tangible silence. I exhaled slowly, taking in the weight of what had just happened. By the slimmest of margins, my plan had been accepted. The opposition had been defeated. I glanced at Dalton. His face had gone pale, his expression a mix of exhaustion and defeat. But I felt no pity. This had been a battle for the future, and there was no room for compromise in such a fight. The room remained quiet as the shareholders digested the results. I knew that I had won this battle, but the war was far from over. Now lay ahead the long road of changing the bank's culture, implementing new rules, and rooting out those who might still seek to undermine my efforts. But today had been pivotal. Inside, my emotions swirled. Relief, triumph but also the sobering realization that the fight was far from finished. The battle for the bank was won, but the real war for change was only just beginning. Dot. After that tense vote, won by the slimmest of margins, I realized that my work was only just beginning. The victory at the shareholders meeting had given me the authority for bold action, but with that power came a tremendous responsibility. Power isn't something you can simply hold without feeling its weight. It's fragile, and it can slip away with a single misstep. I stood at the window of my office, staring out at the world, though my thoughts were elsewhere. The bank I now led felt like a ship sailing through a storm. To steer it out of the chaos, I needed to shed the ballast, the people clinging to the old ways of doing business, those who had sabotaged my reforms and stood in the way of progress. Their time had passed, but I understood that this cleansing wasn't just a matter of firing a few people. It required surgical precision. I needed to remove those dragging the bank down without creating chaos in the process. Acting too hastily or too aggressively could incite even more resistance, and losing the fragile support I had gained could unravel everything I had worked for. I sat at my desk and looked at the list of names before me. I had a clear plan, meet with each of them personally. This wasn't just a matter of business etiquette, it was a matter of principle. I wanted to give them a chance to explain their actions, but I was resolute, their time was up. Every morning when I arrived at the bank, I felt a strange mix of pride and unease. The bank was flourishing. We had launched several social programs, rolled out new lending initiatives to support small businesses and opened funding for projects that had struggled for years to gain approval. The company's reputation was improving and clients were starting to trust us again. It seemed like everything was going according to plan. But that quiet voice in the back of my mind, which had once only whispered, was now screaming about an impending threat. At first, I dismissed the signals, chalking them up to fatigue and the pressure of leading such a large institution through change. But over time, the signs became too clear to ignore. Projects that should have been completed quickly and efficiently were suddenly stalling. Clients who had been problem-free began to complain about delays and service disruptions. The situation was slowly slipping out of control. Each morning, I sat at my desk with a growing sense of dread. Something was wrong, but I couldn't pinpoint the source of the threat. It was invisible, like a shadow moving along the walls an enemy lurking within, waiting for the right moment to strike. I had known that every success comes with a price, but I hadn't anticipated that the threat would come from inside. 
This bank had become more than just a business to me. It was a symbol of the change I wanted to see in the world. But if my enemies were working from within, quietly sabotaging everything I had built, I would have to root them out before they could destroy it all. The challenge ahead felt immense. I realized that external battles were far simpler than the subtle, hidden war being waged in the shadows of my own institution. It was clear that I had enemies still lurking in the organization. Those who resented the changes, those with the power to undermine everything I had achieved. Now, it was time to face this threat directly, to uncover the hidden saboteurs and eliminate them before the foundation I had rebuilt began to crumble. Dot. Every new piece of evidence that the bank was losing ground felt like the rug was being pulled out from under me. My new team, the one I had painstakingly assembled, was working around the clock. We were rolling out innovative ideas and the customers were supposed to see the improvements. But something was clearly going wrong. I could feel it in every dissatisfied client call, in every stalled project that hit roadblocks during execution. I called in Jennifer Lowe, one of the most loyal and insightful members of my team. She had an uncanny ability to identify problems and find solutions. Something's off, I said, skipping any pleasantries. Our programs are stalling, delays are mounting, and clients are beginning to lose trust. I can't figure out why. We've poured all our resources into these projects. Jennifer frowned, her eyes darkening with concern. We've reviewed all the processes. Technically, everything should be running like clockwork, but I think there's something else at play. We've noticed odd inconsistencies in certain departments. It's not just delays. It seems like someone is intentionally slowing things down. Her words made my heart skip a beat. From the beginning, I had known that the old leadership wouldn't give up without a fight, but I hadn't expected them to linger in the bank for this long. Sabotage. It was the only explanation for what was happening. My enemies hadn't left with the departed directors. They had stayed, hiding among the staff, continuing their fight against the changes. We need to find these people, I said, trying to maintain my composure. Whoever they are, they're undermining our work from the inside. We can't let them destroy everything we've built. Jennifer nodded, her expression focused. I'll assemble a team. We'll launch an internal investigation. Internal sabotage. This was the worst case scenario. An enemy within, invisible, difficult to detect at first glance. But I couldn't afford to hesitate. I had to protect what we had created. And to do that, I needed to root out those who sought to undermine us. As Jennifer left to begin the investigation, I felt a growing sense of urgency. This wasn't just about saving a few projects. This was about saving the future of the bank itself. The challenge ahead was clear. Find the saboteurs, cut out the rot, and secure the foundation before it crumbled. Dot. The investigation didn't take long. My team was able to uncover the employees who had remained loyal to the old leadership. These individuals had skillfully hidden among the rest, sabotaging new projects, causing delays, and spreading rumors to undermine trust in me and my reforms. It was a carefully orchestrated act of subversion, and I now faced the toughest decisions of my career. Gathering the team and explaining that a purge was necessary was a painful step. I had always believed that people could change, that they were capable of adapting to new conditions. But these employees had chosen the path of resistance. They clung to the old ways, refusing to see that change was inevitable. I convened my most trusted team members in my office for a meeting. On the table lay a list of those who needed to be removed. It was a painful process, letting go of people I had hoped to inspire to embrace the future. Many of them were professionals, and firing them was difficult on a personal level, but I couldn't afford to take risks. We have to tread carefully, Jennifer said, as she scanned the list. These firings could stir up resentment. We might lose more people than we planned to. I know. I sighed, but if we don't act now, they'll destroy the bank from the inside. They've left me no choice. We need to prevent further sabotage, even if it hurts. The weight of my decisions pressed heavily on me. These people were part of the bank's history, but they refused to embrace its future. 
Each one could have contributed to our mission if they had been willing to adapt. But I couldn't wait any longer. If they had chosen to wage war against me, I had to act decisively, without hesitation. The process of termination began. We said goodbye to people who had perhaps believed they would stay with the bank until the end of their careers, but their journey had now come to an abrupt end. It was difficult for everyone involved. I saw that some of my new team members were also struggling with the reality. Terminations always leave scars, not just on those who are let go, but on those who remain. But I knew it had to be done. By the end of the week, the bank began to take on a new shape. Those who had been sabotaging our projects were gone, and I could already see the team working more cohesively. The pain of these firings would linger for some time, but this step allowed me to regain control and push forward. Still, I was well aware of one thing. A hidden threat never disappears completely. The fight for change was far from over, and new challenges and attacks could arise at any moment. I had won this round, but there was no time to relax. The battle for the future of the bank and the values we were trying to instill would continue dot. Ever since I began implementing changes in the bank, a strange atmosphere had started to form around me. I could feel the tension in the air, as if something rotten was festering beneath the surface. Although we had dealt with the sabotage uncovering and removing those who'd been undermining our work from within, there was one threat that remained unseen a threat that came from someone I trusted. Jackson had been my closest ally since the beginning of this journey. I had always considered him not just a partner, but a friend, someone I could rely on in the toughest moments of the power struggle within the bank. He had supported me through the hardest battles, but something had shifted. At first, I wrote it off as exhaustion or stress, but with each passing day, his actions became more unpredictable. His behavior had become two-sided, in meetings, he supported my ideas, agreeing with the reforms. But behind closed doors, I began to notice odd moments. Certain decisions we discussed in private suddenly faced unexpected challenges. Internal rumors spreading through the bank were eerily similar to information known only to a select few. And all the while, Jackson remained close. I couldn't quite put my finger on what was happening. I wanted to believe in his loyalty but something deep inside told me that I could no longer fully trust him. Perhaps it was paranoia, a result of all the trials I had been through, but I decided to keep a closer eye on him. If this was a conspiracy, it was subtle and dangerous, and I couldn't afford to make a mistake. The thought gnawed at me. If Jackson, of all people, had turned against me, what other risks was I blind to? I had learned one thing through all these struggles. Betrayal rarely comes from where you expect it. If Jackson was involved in something deeper, it meant that this was a challenge I needed to address quietly, with precision. One wrong move, and everything I had fought for could be undone. I began keeping a close watch on Jackson. It wasn't an easy decision. Watching someone you once considered a friend is like watching your confidence in those closest to you crumble. But I had no choice. I couldn't afford to become a victim of betrayal, especially at this critical stage. I tasked my team with conducting a thorough investigation. Some of Jackson's recent financial transactions had caught my attention. Several large transfers to his personal account that he couldn't reasonably explain raised red flags. I asked my people to dig deeper and uncover who was behind these transfers. The results came back quicker than I expected. When the reports landed on my desk, I could hardly believe what I was seeing. The money was coming from one of the rival banking groups I had clashed with before. These people had made numerous attempts to sabotage my reforms, but up until now, they had operated from the outside. Now they had found a way inside, using Jackson as their conduit. Jackson was selling me out. It was a betrayal I couldn't have imagined. The man I trusted had been receiving payments from those who were trying to keep the old order in place within the bank. He had been playing both sides, publicly supporting me while secretly undermining everything I was building. I felt something break inside of me. This wasn't just the betrayal of a business partner. It was a blow I hadn't seen coming. I had always believed I could trust Jackson 
that he shared my values, but the reality was far harsher. Now I was faced with an impossible decision. What to do next? The personal hurt of betrayal was undeniable, but I had to think strategically. If I acted impulsively, I could set off a chain of events that might unravel everything. Jackson was a key figure, and exposing his treachery could send shockwaves through the bank. But I couldn't let him continue to sabotage me from within. I realized I had to approach this with caution, and with the same precision I had used to root out the others. Jackson's betrayal would need to be dealt with quietly, but decisively. Trust was no longer a luxury I could afford. I couldn't wait any longer. After learning about Jackson's double dealing, I decided it was time to confront him face to face. For me, this wasn't just business. It was personal. The betrayal stung deeply, and I needed to hear his explanations, even though I already knew the truth. I invited him to my office, and as he walked in, the tension was almost palpable. Jackson had no idea I knew what he'd been up to. He carried himself confidently, as usual, but there was something unsettling in his demeanor. He sat across from me, and I began the conversation calmly, but with cold determination. Jackson, we need to talk, I said. There are some strange things going on lately, and I think it's time we address them. He leaned forward slightly, ready to hear about some project issues or reform challenges, completely unaware of what was coming. Of course, what's on your mind? He asked, still in the dark about the real purpose of the meeting. Your financial transactions, I said, locking eyes with him. A flicker of surprise crossed his face, followed by a flash of fear he quickly tried to mask. I continued, not giving him a chance to regain his composure. I know you're taking money from our competitors, the people trying to stop the changes we've worked so hard for. I know you've been their puppet. Jackson paled. He opened his mouth to speak, but the words caught in his throat. I could see his confidence slipping away. It's not what you think, he finally stammered, nervously wiping the sweat from his brow. I... I was doing it for the bank. We needed stability. They offered me... help with that. Help? I couldn't stop the bitter smile that crept onto my face. You call that help? You sabotaged our work? Undermined trust in the reforms? You didn't just betray me? You betrayed everything we were trying to build. Jackson fumbled for excuses, but his words were increasingly hollow. He knew he had lost. I had given him the chance to explain, but with each word, he only confirmed what I already knew. This was the end for him. I can't work with you anymore, Jackson. You've destroyed everything. You've written your own ending. I stood up and walked toward the door. His career at the bank was finished. It was a painful decision but I couldn't tolerate betrayal. His departure would be hard, not just for me, but for the team. Yet, it was the only way to keep control of the situation. As Jackson left, I remained alone in my office. Emotions swirled inside me. Anger, disappointment, sadness. The betrayal of someone you once considered a friend leaves a wound that runs deep. But I knew I couldn't let those feelings control me. This was another battle I had won, though the price had been steep dot every morning. As I looked at the bank's towering building, I reminded myself why I had started this journey. After months of battles, sabotage, and betrayal, I felt the weight of exhaustion, but not once did I doubt the path I had chosen. The goal I was striving for had never been clearer. I didn't just want to transform the bank, I wanted to create something bigger, something that could change the entire financial world. I wanted to turn it into a force for justice and equality, serving not only major clients, but also those the system had long ignored. The hospital projects I had launched became a symbol of what the bank could achieve as a force for good. We were saving children's lives, funding innovative medical programs. Clients began to respect us not just for financial stability, but for our ability to do what was right. Each new letter of thanks from the families we helped reminded me of the importance of our work. But I knew this was only the beginning. Even though the bank was starting to show results, my true goal was far more ambitious. 
I saw the opportunity not just to improve one institution, but to turn it into a model for the entire financial sector. I had always been troubled by how the financial system worked against those who didn't fit into its narrow standards. I had been rejected once, and now I had the chance to change that for others. The road ahead was growing steeper. The pressure was mounting, and resistance never entirely disappeared. But my vision remained unchanged. Every step forward, every initiative we launched, brought me closer to the moment when I could finally say, we did it. This was no longer just about fixing a bank. It was about rewriting the rules of an entire industry, and I knew that the stakes had never been higher. Dot. When I first decided to create a program focused on small businesses and those traditional banks had ignored, I knew it would be a challenge. A bank that had operated for years, catering exclusively to large corporate clients, wasn't going to immediately embrace such a shift. But I saw it as more than just a financial opportunity. It was a matter of social justice. At a meeting with my team, I presented my idea, a micro loan and financial support program aimed at small entrepreneurs, especially those who had often faced rejection due to their credit history or social standing. My goal was to give them a second chance, just as I had once been given mine. We will fund those who traditional banks turn away, I said, standing before the team, small scale entrepreneurs, people who have started businesses from the ground up but haven't had the chance to prove their worth. A bank that helps these people will not only be a financial institution, it will be a symbol of change. One of the team members, Marcus, raised his hand and asked, it's a noble goal, but what are the financial risks? We're talking about people who may not be able to repay the loans. I nodded, anticipating the question. Of course, there are risks, but if we develop the right structure and support mechanisms, we can not only minimize those risks, but also create a sustainable growth model for these clients. We'll help them grow, and they'll come back to us with loyalty and gratitude. This bank has always worked with numbers, but it's time we learn to work with people. Marcus thought for a moment, and I could see my idea starting to resonate. There was something in the eyes of the team, more than just doubt. They understood that this program wasn't just a chance to make money. It was an opportunity to prove that our bank was capable of something greater. The room slowly shifted from skepticism to curiosity and then to quiet determination. We were onto something transformative, something that could redefine not only our bank, but also how the financial system could serve those who had been overlooked. I knew the road ahead wouldn't be easy, but at that moment, I felt the spark of change igniting in the room. The bank was beginning to move beyond profit margins and spreadsheets. We were about to become part of something much larger, a force that could reshape lives and industries alike. Dot. The launch of the program took place a few months later. We started with small groups of entrepreneurs who had been unable to secure funding from other banks. These were people with dreams of opening bakeries, repair shops, and IT startups. They came to us with hope, and we gave them a chance. I watched the initial results with cautious optimism. The program was a success. Not only were these entrepreneurs paying back their loans, but they were also bringing us new clients, recommending our bank to their friends and business partners. This wasn't just a financial victory. It was a victory over the old system that had rejected people like them. At one of the events celebrating the success of our program, I stood in front of the audience and spoke. This bank exists not only for those who can present multi-million dollar contracts. We are here for those who have never been given a chance. We are here to give everyone an opportunity because I believe every person deserves a second chance. The room erupted in applause, but inside I didn't feel a sense of triumph. It was something deeper. This was a mission. I wasn't just running a business. I was working to change a system that had rejected people, just as it had once rejected me. I knew there was still a long road ahead, but my goal was now crystal clear. The bank, that had once been a symbol of discrimination and injustice, had now become a force for good. And this was my personal victory. A victory over the past. Over prejudice. Over a system that had tried to stop me. But I also realized that this was just the beginning. The true fight for lasting change had only just begun. 
The success of the program was a milestone, but it was also a reminder of how much further we had to go. The work ahead was daunting, but I was more determined than ever to see this vision through. Dot. When I first sensed that someone from the past was still trying to undermine my efforts, it was just a vague suspicion, an intuition buried beneath the day-to-day -day grind. After all the betrayals and internal purges, I thought I had defeated all my enemies, that anyone who could stand against the changes had either left or resigned themselves to the new reality. But something still wasn't right. The nagging feeling that someone was operating from the shadows wouldn't leave me. The problems I faced didn't seem coincidental. Too many things aligned, like there was an unseen hand guiding these events, hiding behind faces I'd never directly encountered. I knew there was one final enemy left, someone pulling the strings, keeping their cards hidden, someone whose trace had almost been erased, but not entirely. The deeper I dug into the bank's operations, analyzing every new obstacle, the clearer it became that this wasn't just a person. It was a former executive whose influence ran far deeper than I had imagined. He was a strategist, someone who never showed his face, but his methods were unmistakable. He was used to controlling people and circumstances from behind the curtain. His influence extended beyond the bank itself. He was manipulating external financial structures, creating problems for my business from the outside. A flood of emotions overtook me. I was furious, but not blinded by it. That anger gave me strength. I realized that I was gearing up for the final battle. This was the last showdown with someone who had remained in the shadows for far too long. I could feel justice was within reach, but to achieve it, I had to uncover who this person truly was and how deep his connections ran, and I was ready to see it through to the end. This wasn't just about my bank anymore. It was about taking down the very embodiment of the old system, the one that had thrived on manipulation and hidden power. I was prepared for the long fight ahead, knowing that once I exposed him, the foundation of everything he had built would crumble. This final confrontation wasn't just inevitable, it was necessary. My team began the search. We weren't just looking for a name or traces of this man's presence in the bank's dealings. We were hunting for proof of his interference, connections to external structures, and partnerships that could expose his reach. It was painstaking work, requiring focus and patience. Every suspicious move, every deal that seemed out of place, was scrutinized. Thomas, my most trusted ally, was at the forefront of this investigation. He had proven his loyalty time and time again, helping me uncover the truth hidden in the shadows. Together, we sat in my office, poring over documents and reports. We've got something, Thomas said, spreading a set of papers across the desk in front of me. This former executive we've been discussing, he maintained connections with several powerful figures in the market. He's been leveraging those relationships to put pressure on our financial operations. I picked up the documents, feeling a knot tighten in my chest. This was it, the breakthrough we'd been searching for. Do we have solid evidence? I asked, my eyes still fixed on the pages. Yes, Thomas replied. We found records of his communications with representatives from a major financial corporation. He orchestrated several deals that were designed to sabotage our operations. These people were acting under his direct orders. Those words were a turning point. We finally had proof. I now knew for certain that the sabotage was being orchestrated by this man the last remnant of the old leadership. His actions were aimed at undoing everything we had worked so hard to build, at dismantling the changes we had fought to implement. I realized that this evidence wasn't just about linking him to underhanded activities. It was the weapon I needed to completely destroy his influence. We had gathered enough information to stage a public confrontation to expose him to the world. Thomas, I said, setting the papers aside, my resolve hardening. We're going to win this. Prepare everything we need. I want this to be public. Thomas nodded, and I saw the same determination in his eyes that I felt within myself. We were ready to take the final step. This would be no quiet victory. It would be a decisive strike, 
a public reckoning that would not only remove the last vestiges of the old guard, but also send a message to anyone still thinking of resisting the new order. We had the proof, and soon, the world would know the truth. The day of the press conference had arrived. I stood backstage, feeling adrenaline surge through my veins. This was the moment I had fought for all these months. Journalists, financial leaders, and my business partners were gathered in front of me, waiting for what I had to say. But what mattered most to me was that this moment would mark the end of the influence of the man who had hidden in the shadows, working to sabotage my plans. I stepped onto the stage, holding a folder of documents. The microphone in front of me was the only thing separating me from the audience. I could feel their attention, the tension in the air, as if they sensed something significant was about to unfold. Today, I'm here to tell you about what has been happening behind the scenes of the financial world, I began, my voice steady, about things that remain hidden from most, but that impact lives and futures. We conducted an investigation, and what we uncovered was shocking. I opened the folder and began to read the evidence, documents linking my last enemy to illegal operations and acts of sabotage. As I spoke, I watched the expressions of the journalists and attendees change as they began to grasp the gravity of what I was revealing. This wasn't just about one man trying to hold on to power. It was an entire system using its old connections to undermine progress. These documents prove that the individual you all know by name has used his influence to sabotage our projects and obstruct progress. He operated in the shadows, manipulating events from behind the scenes. But today, his actions will be exposed to the public. I could feel the mix of anger and satisfaction rising within me. This man could no longer hide. The world now knew who was responsible for the setbacks we had faced. The final blow came as I announced his imminent arrest, bringing an official end to his reign of manipulation. It was the last nail in the coffin of the old system, the final blow to those who had resisted change. I now held not only financial influence, but the moral high ground. I had won this war. As I stepped off the stage, a strange sense of relief washed over me. There was a deep feeling of closure inside. I had defeated every obstacle in the way of progress. But I also knew that the work was far from over. Today, however, I could be certain that the old world, the one that had once rejected me, was gone for good. Now, the path forward was mine to shape. The system that had tried to crush me had been dismantled, and I was free to build something better. The battle was won, but the real journey of creating a new future was just beginning dot. As I stood in front of the bank, everything I saw reminded me of the long journey that had brought this institution to where it stood today. This place, once a symbol of exclusion, rejecting people like me who didn't fit its narrow standards, was now my bank. It was no longer just a financial institution. It had become a symbol of change, equality, and justice. Each morning, as I began my work, I felt a strange mixture of pride and a slight sense of unease. We had torn down the old system, removed those who upheld discrimination, and now I faced a new challenge, building something entirely new on the ruins of the old order. Tearing down was one thing, but building something sustainable and transformative was another entirely. Now that the old obstacles were gone, it was up to me to ensure that this bank would not just be a place of business, but an example for the entire country. My thoughts often drifted back to the people who had been turned away for years. People who didn't fit the stereotypes, who were denied opportunities because the system didn't give them a chance. These were the very people for whom I was ready to take this new path. Every step I took was moving me closer to my goal of creating a culture where money didn't dictate someone's fate, where access to finance was equal for everyone. I was determined to implement reforms that wouldn't just improve the bank, but would change the way we approached lending. The first steps involved retraining our staff and eliminating any discriminatory practices embedded in the system. I understood that for the change to be real, it had to start at the foundation. We needed to create a culture where the bank wasn't a gatekeeper to opportunity, but a facilitator, 
a place where success wasn't determined by someone's background or connections, but by their potential and determination. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but the transformation we had begun had already set the stage for something truly groundbreaking, and I was ready to lead it. Dot we gathered all the bank's employees for the first phase of retraining. I stood before the audience, which now included not only new hires, but also those who had survived our purge. They looked at me, waiting for what I had to say, and I understood how crucial this moment was for them, as much as it was for me. Today, we were laying the foundation for a new order. You all know this bank is no longer what it once was, I began, scanning the room. We've been through a lot of challenges, and I know some of you have witnessed changes that seem too radical. But these changes are necessary. We will no longer follow outdated practices. We will not judge people based on their social status, race, or background. The room was silent. I could see tension on some faces, while others showed signs of approval. It was important for me to convey that they weren't just employees. They were part of something much bigger. From now on, lending will be accessible to everyone. We are developing new programs that will allow small entrepreneurs, especially those from vulnerable communities, to access opportunities that were previously out of reach. We will support those who dream of starting their own businesses, but have always been told, no. This is not just a reform, this is justice. I could feel the energy in the room shift as support began to grow. I had brought in some of the best teams to implement these programs, and we had formed partnerships with governmental and non-governmental organizations to launch small business support initiatives. After the meeting, Marcus, one of the new directors who had been a strong advocate for my reforms, approached me. That was powerful, he said, patting me on the shoulder. Now, the key is to follow through. People are watching us with high expectations, and we can't afford to let them down. I nodded, knowing he was right. This wasn't just a bold idea. It was real work that required constant attention. But I was confident we could do it. We had the vision, the tools, and now the momentum. It was time to transform the bank into what it was always meant to be. A place where everyone had a fair chance, dot. Several months had passed since the reforms began. Each day brought new challenges, but also new victories. The bank didn't just adapt to the changes, it became the driving force behind them. Our new programs were up and running and the results exceeded my expectations. Small entrepreneurs who had once been denied access to credit were now launching their businesses. We had given a second chance to those the system had once rejected. One of the most moving moments happened during a meeting with a group of young entrepreneurs who had received funding through our new programs. One of them, a woman named Lisa, stood up and said to me, I came to this bank a few years ago and was turned away. I thought my dream of opening a bakery would never come true. But today, I'm standing here because you gave me a chance. I'm grateful to you for restoring my faith in my own potential. Her words filled me with pride. This was exactly what I had fought for. The bank had become more than just a financial institution. It had become a symbol of equality and justice. At one of the major financial forums where I was invited to speak, I shared our success stories, explaining how we had changed our approach to lending. My words sparked interest, and I could see that our bank had become an example for other institutions. But most importantly, we had proven that change was possible. The culmination of this journey was the recognition of the bank as a symbol of transformation in the financial industry. We had become known not just for our business success, but for breaking the old system where discrimination and bias had been the norm. Now, standing on stage before hundreds of people, I knew that I had achieved the impossible. I had transformed a system of exclusion into a system of opportunity. But this victory wasn't just mine. It belonged to everyone who had supported me, who believed in change. Together, we had built something greater than just a bank. We had created a movement, a testament to the power of giving people a chance, regardless of where they came from. And while there was still more work to be done, I knew that we had laid the foundation for a better, more inclusive future. Dot. Several years had passed since the day I first stepped into this bank, determined to change everything. I remember that day as if it were yesterday. The cold reception, the prejudice, 
and inequality that hit me like a freezing wind. Back then, I was just one of many who had been rejected for reasons that had nothing to do with my abilities or my project. My skin color and social status seemed to matter more than my ideas. But now, as I looked at the bank that had become mine, I saw how much everything had changed. This place, once a symbol of everything wrong with the financial system, had become an example of what was possible. We had implemented sweeping reforms, introduced programs that gave chances to those who had never been given one before. We had become more than just a financial institution. We had become a symbol of hope and equality. Every day, walking into this building, I saw the results of our work. Small entrepreneurs, once rejected by the system, were now building their businesses, creating jobs, and contributing to the growth of the community. People who had once been on the brink of despair were now thriving, and I knew that behind these changes were not just my efforts, but the support of those who believed in my vision. Yet, deep inside, a feeling was growing that my journey here was coming to an end. The bank no longer needed my day-to-day -day leadership. My time as its leader had run its course, and I began to reflect on what I would leave behind. Legacy, it's more than money or success. It's the memory, the ideas, and the changes that continue to live on long after you're gone. I realized that the bank and everything we had built would carry on without me. It had become a force for good, an example of how a broken system could be transformed into one of opportunity. My mission had been accomplished, and now it was time to step back and let the next generation continue the work. I had proven that change was possible, and that alone gave me peace. Dot, when I began discussing my intention to step down with the team, I noticed a sense of unease on some of their faces. They had grown accustomed to seeing me at the helm, always making decisions and steering the bank forward. For many, I wasn't just a leader. I was the person who had shown them that it was okay to embrace change. Are you really going to leave? Jennifer Lowe, my closest ally, asked when I shared my decision with her. I nodded feeling the weight of the words, even though the decision had been made long ago. Yes, I said, trying to maintain my composure. The bank is strong, the team is capable, and everything is working just as we planned. My time here has come to an end, but your work is only just beginning. Jennifer paused, and I could see a mix of respect and doubt flash across her face. But you were the one who changed everything. How will the bank move forward without you? That's exactly why I know it's time to go, I replied, offering a smile. True leadership isn't about staying in control. It's about empowering others to take the reins and continue driving change. Everything we've accomplished is the result of teamwork. You, Marcus, the entire team, you're ready to carry on what we started. I watched as her expression softened and she nodded. You've always known how to inspire. We won't let you down. I knew that Jennifer and the team were more than capable. My departure wasn't an ending, but the beginning of a new chapter for them. Over the years, they had learned so much, and now they were ready to lead the bank to new heights on their own. It was their turn to create the future, to ensure the bank's legacy continued to grow, rooted in the values we had established together. As I stepped back, I felt a deep sense of peace, knowing that the seeds we had planted would continue to flourish in their capable hands. Dot. My last day at the bank came faster than I expected. I stood in my office taking in everything we had accomplished. The room was filled with memories of battles, victories, and losses. But more than anything, my thoughts were on the people we had impacted. Legacy isn't just about leaving a mark in the company's history. It's about the lives we've changed. I thought of the entrepreneurs who started their businesses thanks to our programs. I remembered the families whose lives had improved because of the loans we provided. I knew my time here was over, but the bank would continue the work we started and go even further. My final press conference was brief. I stood before a room filled with journalists, clients, and employees, and I said what I had been reflecting on for some time. This isn't a goodbye, it's a new step. The bank you see today isn't just my achievement, it's all of ours. Together, we've built a system where justice and equality are at the core. 
But the most important thing is that there are even more changes and opportunities ahead. I'm leaving, but my ideas will remain with you. When I finished, the room erupted in applause. But I knew those claps weren't just for me. They were a recognition of the change we had created together. I realized that my legacy wasn't just the bank, but the new standards of fairness that could no longer be ignored. The financial system could never go back to the way it was. That was my true victory. As I left the building for the last time, a strange sense of relief washed over me. I knew I had done everything I could. I left the system better than I found it. Now it belonged to those who would continue to fight for justice and equality, even after I was gone.